Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? I'm joining Michael Kester this evening. My name is Eric, and uh, as an audience, uh, as a collective body of listeners, you are in fact listening to Double Feature for now until yeah. <laughs> until the show starts. Until we mention chapters, and then about you're... a minute and a half in, when you find out it's not Rocky Five and the Machine Girl, but actually uh, kids and happiness, you're probably going to bail. Only kidding. You like Rocky Five and the Machine Girl. You think that's a fine setup? I think for a, yeah. I, Rocky Five and the Machine Girl is a great. It's a great double feature. But we're gonna spoil both of those movies. We have a, a feature in our show called Chapters. It's a segment. It's of a our utility. Show. It's a utility <laughs> you can use. Yeah, it is also a segment where I talk about chapters for twenty minutes. I'm gonna make it short. There's chapters. Look it up. Something else you should look up just briefly. If you're uh, just now joining us here in Double Feature Land. Rocky Five and the Machine Girl might seem like a strange double feature. In fact, it's possibly, I can think of one pairing that I can think of would be two, would be a worse episode to... Uh, the last two Rocky Asia shows? Would yeah, that be? I think that would be, I think that would be the worst. Was that actually your answer? It was, yeah. Oh, that's great. The Kill Bill ones? The Kill Bill ones were fine. We did, I don't know what happened there. Well, here's what happened. So we did Rocky and Shogun Assassin, and then we did uh, Rocky Two and Sex and Fury. We took a little break from our strict Asian cinema uh, regimen, and then we did uh, Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2 with Rocky 3 and 4. Right. Now, we are back in true form here. We are in the sure. now the third wave, right. the final wave of our, uh, our Rocky films paired up with discovering yeah. Asian cinema centered around Kill Bill. Yeah. See, the thing with Rocky is Rocky doesn't really come in waves. Well, maybe the sixth one is a different wave. I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll find out. But the Asian films, since they're not actually all sequential, they're kind of in groups. In yeah. Pairs. So we did old Asian cinema. We mm-hmm. did American influenced uh, right. Asian cinema. And, and now and... we're doing Asian influenced by American cinema influenced by Asian cinema. Oh my God. We yeah. should start with Rocky Five. This is a, I mean, this is a capsule film for me. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, the film's from 1990. It's how I remember the early 90s. Okay. The early 90s being definitively different than when we talked about The Matrix, that being the late. Yeah. The late 90s, for some reason, is uh, Spawn and Trenchcoats. Yeah, me. that's true. Spikes. That did happen. Bad music. Oh, my God. Yeah, there was a lot of bad music, probably still in my iTunes library. Uh, have you heard that Corn Dubstep album yet, Refuse. by the way? Refuse. No, you're right. There, there was a lot of bad music in the late 90s. But uh, the early 90s had its fair share of that awful kind of Rob bass. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the Joey Ellis song in this movie, Go For It. I oh mean, my that's God. The, I think that was every Rocky film seems to have a song composed for it. Yeah. I can't find that song anywhere but Rocky <laughs> Five. If you Google it, all that comes up is videos from Rocky Five. So I think that's probably what it is. But there was a lot of that. MC Hammer, I think, is on the soundtrack. Oh, my God. Uh, if you watched In Living Color during the early 90s, all that kind of music that was on there was a very, I, I call it bad because it was, it sounds very cheap and it has this kind right. of, uh, bad quality. It's kitschy. You know what yeah, I mean? Sure. It's kitschy, but there was stuff coming, you know, NWA and a lot of legitimate sure. well, stuff. I mean, a lot of hip hop, hip hop was really in its heyday in the late 80s and early mm-hmm. 90s. That's when Ice T got started. That's when Snoop Dogg and The Chronic all came out. Right. And then also there, that's where alternative rock sure. started same time sure so when you say bad music you you meant alternative rock specifically mostly well that's what happened to uh to rap is it got so popular that we had pop rap we had mc hammer sure we also had dirty city streets and yeah. that's uh i think that's a lot of why this is kind of a capsule film why it feels like you know that um uh, you know it's the scene where he's telling his son about the hustle right and sure his son is talking about urban blight which is, uh, we've never really covered Urban Blight. It's that sort of, uh, you know, when I think about that, I think about Spike Lee films, the early, yeah. like, do the right thing, that kind of stuff. Um, maybe a little bit when we talked about Candyman, because yeah, I know we talked sure. about uh, Cabrini Green and that area of Chicago. It's like Sesame Street with more litter. Yeah, it's definitely got a weird Sesame Street thing to it. Mm-hmm. That's It's very strange that you mentioned that. Um, a lot of boarded up windows. Lot of, there's just a, a kind of look to Urban Blight. There's sure. almost a visual aesthetic to yeah. it. 
it's uh, it's one of those things that I don't know. Maybe for me, the the reason I stick to that is we still have that in Chicago. You know, that was That's very true. '90s, but the South Side of Chicago is infamous for that. Well, and it's not even just the South Side. If you find yourself in the right areas of oh, sure. even the North or the West Side, sure. the area that I'm specifically thinking of to caricature urban blight in chicago is mm-hmm. the little italy neighborhood i don't know if you've been down oh there, no no no. where's that at it's it's down by taylor and ashland oh okay sure um off taylor street mm-hmm. and it just i mean it looks like gritty sesame street that yeah. is i mean it's the next best thing to having a time machine you go down there and it really is it feels like the early 90s part of that is the city develops around those areas sure and that kind of causes i mean that's one of the causes of urban blight uh, the time capsule thing is a side product. It's uh, it's right. not the reason I love uh, this chapter of the Rocky Saga. It I just love it because be... there are fewer montages and fewer robots than the previous ah, installment. So you are catching on. <laughs> yeah, right from the beginning, uh, the movie's a little bit different than the other Rocky films we've seen. We get our usual previous on Rocky, but there's also the freeze frames. You know, it becomes a title sequence that makes it a little bit different. Sure. I think this, of all the recaps we've gotten, since we got the very first one and it was still fresh and humorous, this has actually been, you know, legitimately speaking, the best recap. We're, uh, we're doing something a little bit different and it feels like, oh, we didn't, we're not just doing this because all the other films did it. It's kind of honoring that tradition, but putting a little bit of a spin on it. It's a small thing, but you know, when we get through that, we cut directly to naked Sylvester Stallone. You're Jessica Alba. Well, it's the scene from Machete. Isn't it's that the weird? scene from Machete where Jessica Alba's in the shower completely naked, but you don't get to see anything. Yeah, that's it's it. the artful coy, mm-hmm. except it's sliced alone. And it also, that means it came first. And that means that I guess Jessica Could Alba was back. actually just doing the sliced alone thing. And then you mm. get into a really weird sexual thing Bizarre. for me. Bizarre. But Rocky's not about the sex. He's about the heart. Naked Stallone is uh, not the director this time around. This is, um, I remember you asking me about that, I think on the first show, and, uh, and I refused to answer at the time. But uh, he is the star of this film and the sole writer this time around, which is kind of interesting. But he's not the director. We have uh, John G. Avildsen back from the original Rocky. Okay. So he kind of went off to do a couple of the Karate Kid movies and a couple uh, other things. Three Ninjas and, kick back. Well, he did three fucking Karate Kid movies, and then he <laughs> comes back and he does the fifth Rocky. And this is the only other movie in the franchise not directed by Stallone. We will see him come back to do the uh, sixth one. Rocky Balboa. So you start to get this idea that this one's going to be a little bit different. They hit you with some pretty heavy stuff right from the beginning, but we immediately fall back into, you know, Rocky gets off the plane and right. <laughs> Richard Gant comes out, not as Don King, but right. as Duke. Yeah. <laughs> More important, not only is he not playing Don King, but he's also not eating a heart, which is... That's good. also... Yeah. We haven't seen him on the show not eating a heart. We joke about this on here all the time, but this is actually the actor from the ninth Jason film, <laughs> the Jason film with the aforementioned uh, heart eating. And, you know, just as intense in this film as he is uh, wolfing down hearts. That's fine. But what I love about this scene is that this is almost a self-aware moment where, you know, Rocky's giving his usual, oh, I'm back from Russia, and here's some little jokes and, and whatever. And I'm a nice guy, and you know what's going on, America. Everybody loves me. Yeah, what's up? Welcome, uh, welcome me back, America. And Duke comes out to challenge him or whatever, and uh, a woman stands up, and she just goes, isn't this uh, a bad time for a challenge? I mean, he yeah. just got off the plate. It's the most rational thing anyone in any of these movies has ever fucking said. Yep. You thought it would get more rational when uh, when Mick was no longer in the series, but um, then we got a robot, and that got yeah. a little nuts. And uh, and finally, someone just stands up and goes, uh, you know, this happens every fucking time. Can we just... Who gave this guy a microphone? Yeah. Can we just go back to reality for a moment? And I guess we do, right? Rocky retires. I mean, how much more do you hit... Re- he actually retires. Not like the last two films where, right. uh, Rocky, you got a bad heart. You got to retire. Sure. You know, Adrian doesn't want you to box anymore. You yeah, got to retire. Rocky, previously in the Rocky films, Rocky, uh, he kind of, he bows out. He sure. doesn't retire. He just, he's out he of the game. He bows out until he has a press yeah. conference and yeah. someone challenges he, him. He basically, he, he sits down and he goes, okay, how long can I sit out before 
I officially need to train extra hard to get back in. Yeah, that's it, right? He only stays out of the game long enough to necessitate a montage. That's (laughs) really the formula. (laughs) And so he has Adrian talking him out of it. He's in his 40s. He has CSP. You know, he's having all of these medical complications. And so he decides this is it. I'm actually... He he kind of has this moment during the press conference where he it's he just gives up. He yep. just says, "Fuck this." You know what? I'm not gonna stand around. I've been here when this happens before. I'm gonna peace out. He thinks about it and he legitimately goes, "I'm done." Mm-hmm. And then he runs into financial trouble. Yeah, because Polly fucked up. Because fucking Polly. Well, this is great too because you had the press conference. You thought, "Oh, here comes a new challenger." And he doesn't do that. And then you find out he's out of money. Right. So now you're thinking, oh, now we're back to the formula. Sure. Now Rocky is hard up for cash and he's going to. But he says, fuck it to that, too. Yeah. He has that conversation where he thinks, well, what am I going to go back to commercials? What am I really going to do? Says all I can do is fight and I don't want to fight. So I don't know what we're going to do. And fuck Polly, it. I'm going to stay retired and we're going to move yeah. back. To, Polly's back been to jilted by his robot. So he's got to stick with us. So then we're back to Urban Blight, Philadelphia. We're back to the uh, the gym and the humble home and the no money. Sure. And, you know, we're back to seeing Mick, too. Yeah, we get I mean, these... we're back to the basically the first film. It is. It's it all back. It uh, Even the, the neighborhood exception... priest right. yeah. uh, comes back, leaning out the window. The only exception being that Rocky has a, a kid who's completely... Um... Yeah, he, uh, he educates Rocky a little bit. He plays um, a couple different roles that... You know, in the way that Adrian was kind of Rocky's smarter counterpart back in the day, or even just to reconnect with a younger Rocky. He was never quite as young in this series as his son is in this movie, uh, who I believe is actually still on the Yeah, I think so too. But between him and Tommy, that's a way to kind of bring in younger Rocky. Yeah, exactly. The two of them combined are younger Rocky, but they're so separate. And they have to be separate because at the end of the day, you can't, Rocky can't. He's not ready to fight himself. So usually on the Rocky shows, especially when we're doing a Cold War uh, story, we're talking really heavily about themes. And I think the, uh, you know, all these elements we're describing might include a theme about returning to your roots. That seems to be what, what we're getting at here. But I feel like the actual story that Stallone's written for this is talking more about, uh, it's talking about some pretty interesting things. One, we have... His son, you know, there's a a lot of different themes that play into that. There's this tried and true cinematic story, especially in uh, maybe not coming of age films, but, uh, you know, movies for children of a father who's absent from their lives. Sure. A dad who works too much and spends too much time at the tables or at the bar. You got it. Uh, Arrested Development made fun of that uh, in talking about the son who's waiting outside all day to go fishing with his dad, right? That's the joke about that cliche. But this is a a really odd kind of paternal jealousy we have here, right? I mean, this is his son wants to get to know his father and hang out with him and just be around his dad. And his dad isn't at his job necessarily i mean i guess for rocky you know we could have done a story where rocky's always off boxing and you know defending his honor and making right. his money back and fixing paulie's problems but that's not it rocky's retired now and in that moment where his son hopes oh he's retired i'll get to know my dad instead he hangs out with tommy and treats tommy like his son <laughs> he basically replaces his son with tommy here's a, a protege that i'm gonna raise and so that's um, that's an interesting turn on a classic theme anyways, but uh, they throw some more stuff in there. I mean, the entire story of Tommy, it's not just about he raises this guy to you know carry on his name, carry the torch for him. Instead, there's this sort of turn where he trains, Tommy defects, and then he has to defeat Tommy Yeah, in a street fight, nonetheless, yeah. which is kind of weird. So these are all things that are just interesting on a writing level, but it's definitely things that I think uh, betray that usual Rocky formula in the the best way possible. Mm -hmm. You know, Rocky actually retires. The movie, as you mentioned, it's much lighter on montages. There's no final boxing match, which is another huge thing, right? The fact that there's a street fight instead of a boxing match is honestly, it's surprising. You know, you get to the end and you have that street fight. And when the music starts to swell, you think, oh, this could be the end of the movie. That's... 
how are they going to top this? Sure. And as he lands those punches and everyone exchanges their final little quippy words, Huzzah. you realize that's, wow, that's the end. That's, that's the how final we're battle. Mm -hmm. Normally, Rocky films end with the fight, freeze frame, credits. Well, there's an extra we got out of the game moment sure. to resolve this, uh, this conflict he was having with his son. And you were saying that this was supposed to be the last Rocky film, so they had to wrap it up. They had to go and say, oh, well, it doesn't just end with a fight. Well, they planned it to be the last. Sure. And, and you know, that's why the, the credits uh, recount the previous films. But this being such a departure from the rest of the series, there was a very mixed reaction to that, mm -hmm. you know, and I think a lot of that comes from betraying the formula from people sign up for these movies, expecting the same thing over and over, expecting to see Rocky box. Yeah, expecting to see, yeah, definitely. And you get this story with Tommy kind of, you know, uh, taking Rocky's place and they're only focusing on him really from afar from Rocky's point of view. So you're not in the ring. You don't have a motivational death. That right. seems to be what, you know, what has become a crutch for the series uh, at this point. You, I mean, you'd never seen this before. You went into this expecting someone to die, right? Uh, yeah, I was hoping an... it'd be Polly. <laughs> Always hoping I know it's you Pauly. did mention that on the previous show, that Polly would, would go on to train Rocky, and <laughs> that may be his uh, death curse. Is that where I'm going with that? You know what I mean. Instead, we're getting a story about luring Tommy down the dark side, and uh, this kind of... I, you know, Rocky movies always talking about show business, but that, sure. uh, that appeal to all that we kept Rocky away from, all that Mick kept Rocky away from the whole time, Tommy falling prey to that and what that does to him. And Rocky's still interested in Tommy, even after, you know, he kind of defects. He's still cheering him on. Sure. He still takes pride in him. It's not really until, you know, he's kind of giving him the benefit of the doubt. And then Tommy gets on TV and basically says, fuck off. Yeah. So not terribly unlike Rocky's own bottoming out, Stallone claims to have basically made this film for cash. Huh. He, uh, he's unhappy with how it turned out, and honestly, most audiences uh, really agreed it's with it. It's probably him. the best one since the second one for me. I think that might have a little to do with how you and I are watching them. Yeah. This is similar to revisiting the first film, which is a nice refresher. But it also uh, defies what would by now in this franchise be a stale formula. When we're doing these things uh, the way we do them, we're watching them as kind of a complete set. We're thinking about it like it's a franchise, mm -hmm. not just, though I haven't seen a Rocky film in 10 years and now I'm watching a Rocky film. I really just want to be watching Rocky 1, but I'm watching Rocky 5 because it's in the theater. And I think that's what happens with a lot of people. But when we're considering the whole franchise... This is the kind of breath of fresh air that's really needed here. We need to stir things up. We need to defy a formula, do some more interesting. I mean, I think it's perfect at yeah, that. I think so, it too. It tells new stories with new themes. It reconnects with an old character somehow at the same fucking time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd be happy if the series ended here. I'm not really sure, but we know now that we have one more left, and that might change You know, our, our take on this. Stallone... Uh, this is kind of weird, too, especially for the first time we've ever seen this. Maybe the first time I've ever heard of this even happening. Stallone basically wanted to redeem the character after this. Uh, a couple of years or whatever after the movie, maybe immediately after, I don't know. He looked at this and he said, I wasn't satisfied with this movie. I, it was just me cashing in. Uh, he doesn't like it, right? Right. He makes, uh, 15 years later or something, he makes the sequel. And he made the sequel based on the fact that this was poorly received critically, financially, and that he was unhappy with it. And I've never heard of a sequel being made because the previous film did so poorly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, Usually, that's true. Especially with the fucking movies we watch on here, sequels are to cash in. Right. They are not uh, because the, oh man, that last film was so bad. You know what? Let's really fix the Rocky right. legacy and yeah. create one more final film. So I guess we move away from the fifth installment of our Rocky journey, and we uh, travel back over the ocean to uh You really, you're, Asia. you're loving this uh, I like America, it. Asia thing. You really Feels came like around a journey on this. to me. Yeah. I love it. So as we mentioned before, we are into the third leg of yeah. Asia craziness, uh, which is back to the foreign films, and it's basically... This is the one I'm worried about, yeah, essentially. This is, well, this is the hardest one. The whole point of this entire process is to get anybody who's actually taking the ride with us mm -hmm. to get them to this point and, more importantly, to the next point. Sure. Uh, to the crazier. And have them 
understand why these movies exist and sure. where they came from. Yeah, for us to understand that, attempt to understand that, see if we can make everybody else who's sure. in the same boat with us understand it, that. It doesn't necessarily mean people have to like Machine Girl, mm -hmm. but I feel like it's a lot easier to enjoy Machine Girl when you know where its roots come from. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that is made so blatantly obvious sure. in the very first scene of machine girl well yeah the william tell routine yeah well this is great because uh i my eyes lit up right yeah we have william tell and i thought oh yeah i know this we covered this we covered this on naked lunch this is william s burroughs doing william tell i mean i know william tell sure i can get behind this and uh and there's a lot of kill bill going on yeah. in here well, we'll talk about the kill bill but you know that thing you mentioned of these modern asian movies uh we haven't discussed it a lot and we'll probably talk about it a little bit more when we do the the next one. But Asian extreme is a genre, much like the sure. the new French extreme, right. and a lot of the um, the old school American horror type of things we're seeing in other parts of the world. But Asian extreme is uh, notably more challenging, yeah. for at least for me personally. No, it is than the rest of the. It makes less sense to me. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to do Machine Girl is because mm -hmm. the storyline is almost, it's almost <laughs> too coherent. Yeah, it almost stands out against all yeah. of the other stuff because of how much sense it makes. Yeah, because of how easy it is to actually follow the storyline of Machine Girl. Sure. But in the beginning, it's still a little out of order because she's got her machine gun arm and we see her doing some fucking craziness. Yeah. But the blood squirts, just like in Shogun Assassin. Sure. And she's sassy and sexy, just like Sex and Fury. Mm -hmm. And everything is just very Kill Bill and stylized and everybody's jumping around and kicking ass. And just momentarily, I'm uh, I'm really happy with you. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you know, this is, you told me as we're pairing this stuff up, you said, we're going to center this whole thing around Kill Bill. My only, the only thing I brought to the table here was, hey, maybe we'll do Asian stuff because I'm interested in all that. And uh, I want to do all the Rocky films. And you crafted really this entire lineup of Asian films. Yeah. And, you know, where to fit in Kill Bill and all of that. And I just went with it. And it could have <laughs> been a disaster. That, that was a lot of trust, right? Yeah. Because I Who had. That's true. I have seen all the Rocky movies, with the exception of the last one, which I'm saving for the show. Uh, I have seen none of the Asian movies, with the exception of Kill Bill, which, I mean, both of those are sure. American films. So I just went with it. Yeah. I said, okay, Michael, maybe at the very worst, this will be a huge catastrophe, <laughs> and I can just make fun of it, and That's it'll true. be six terrible episodes, which, right. I mean, at this point, we have 195 terrible episodes, so I'm not, I'm not too worried about that. But in fact, when this happened, this was the uh, the final confirmation. In the first minutes of this, I saw the Kill Bill. Yeah, I fucking saw it, and I said, "Ah, oh, this all makes sense." Yeah, the uh, the plan has finally been validated. Yeah, it's great. It's this. It's bizarre to see the two things blended again. Yeah, because it when is. we first it watched is. Kill Bill, it was weird watching Kill Bill after Shogun Assassin and Sex yeah. and Fury because it felt very clear. Sure. that. That it was based and also on strangely these... retroactive somehow. Right. I don't know in what direction to what direction. <laughs> yeah, but something about it, the pieces fell together. I mean, remember how shocked we were on the second Kill Bill episode yeah. when Shogun Assassin came up. We both just kind of thought, uh, "Wow, that was convenient, wasn't yeah. it?" Yeah. And now it's just it's weird again seeing Machine Girl be this blend of. I mean, it's like it's it's when you do your homework and yeah. you you come to class and everything makes sense. Yeah, that's yeah, essentially right. what it feels like watching Machine Girl. And now imagine watching Machine Girl without this background. Sure, it a lot of it. Oh the, yeah, the I, style would be sure. lost. You don't realize that it's supposed to be stylistic and it's it's campy in a really stylized way. Sure, you'd instead write it off as bad acting. Poor filmmaking. Those Japanese people don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, you wouldn't understand the camp. Right. But instead, you get a very well-executed, sexy action blood fest. And that is really... That's the big thing with moving back to the Asian stuff, is it just gets more fucking violent. Yeah, we did um, uh, kind of mixing in a, a smaller amount of it. We also tackled a couple Takashi Miike yeah. things uh, in the year two. We joke about the, the nudity being the theme of year four, 
but we really wanted to hit a lot of this Asian stuff sure. and um, unfamiliar cinema and kind of pair it with things that we had more of a handle on. And I think that's been really helpful in it too. You know, from the, the second we get the scene with her holding the picture up and there's the sound effect. Yeah. I mean, that's where I just know, you know, I, I understand where this is coming from. I'm seeing it now. Everything's coming together. Or the the camera, you know, showing the side of the actor's head, right. and then they turn uh, to face it. I mean, just these uh, these things stylistically. It could be Kill Bill. Maybe they're big Edgar Wright fans. I mean, who are we to I actually guess, yeah, say you never what's really derivative? Know. Yeah, we can't make a, a full list of here's everything we think comes from yeah. Kill Bill. There's obviously a mixed bag of this stuff. Sure. But it's, uh, it's undeniable a lot of that overlapping background, especially when we get something like a Hattori Hanzo reference. Yeah. That, That's a perfect example. Yeah. Because it could be a Kill Bill thing, but you also were telling me that that's just apparently a big legend in Japan. Yeah, it, well, it comes into popular culture a lot. Yeah. I mean, we didn't really talk about it on the show, but uh, Hitori Hanzo in Kill Bill itself, it, I mean, that's the Sonny Chiba role. Right. He played Hitori Hanzo in Shadow Warriors in the 1980s, that Japanese TV thing that uh, Tarantino apparently is super into. Sure. And you see Hitori Hanzo and the Hanzo name and Hanzo swords pop up in a lot of, st- I mean, more so in Japanese culture. Right. And, uh, you know, in various pieces of Asian cinema than over here. But you see that stuff here, too. And there's Shogun Assassin references here and there. I mean, it's small stuff where you sure. can kind of feel like that's a little derivative. Well, there's, you know, you get the thing where she's looking out for her family and she's sure. got a, that's all about, you know, what are they, the thing, the thing that I always remember about Shogun Assassin is the tagline, sure. which is, they shall pay with rivers of their blood. Right, yeah. And, I mean, that stands to reason with Machine Girl, right? Yeah. That is That is the underlying premise. Sure. It's like you could be talking about the same fucking yeah. movie, right? Yeah, so maybe they share influences. Uh, maybe we're just talking about the genre as a whole. But sure. the important part is this stuff all kind of blends together into, you know, what we're seeing now. I mean, even if you were to ask the director specifically... I don't know that you could point to uh, references that would be accurate so much as just, you know, it's like uh, it's like when we were talking on the Equilibrium show about how Hong Kong influenced gunfighting sure. and turning the gun sideways and, you know, you... Which is absolutely the most inaccurate way to fire a gun. Thanks, Mythbusters. Oh, what a good episode. <laughs> and, and a good handful of episodes of our, our own that it's been since you mentioned Mythbusters on the show. Gotta keep it current. No, it was really good. My point is you could probably go back and uh, really say, okay, here was the first movie that did that or or what have you. But when you look at today's modern gun combat, you realize it's an amalgam of all of these these different elements. And I think that's the same with Machine Girl. It reminds me of uh, in year one, we covered Battle Royale. Yeah. Right. And we haven't really talked about how Battle Royale weaves into all this stuff. But the most clear Kill Bill kind of tie in is uh, Ami, the titular Machine Girl. Right. Which may be a reference back to Gogo in the Kill Bill movies. Sure. Uh, Kiriyama, who played a similar role when she did, um, I think it was Chigusa in Battle Royale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which we know that, you know, Tarantino, that was only a couple years prior. Sure. And he was a big fan. And, and that's kind of where his that... favorite movie of the last 20 years sure. or some shit. Yeah. So he's a fan of that. He puts that character in there. So does that make this a reference to Kill Bill? Does it make it a reference to Battle Royale? Is it just a schoolgirl outfit and that's been in places before 2003? That's obviously not the We can't the first give a definitive answer. We don't have the man here to answer the question. Who can actually say... Kiriyama was also in uh, Juan, which is another kind of genre of Asian cinema that we that American talked about. Yeah, we the talked American, about it in the first yeah. year and never got around to covering it because we probably should. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when we finally get uh, a good kind of handle on this stuff, I think we can start tackling the ghost stories and, and sure. The well, they get back and forth fucked there. up. Have you ever seen Uzumaki? No, I haven't. That one was so fucked up. America couldn't even remake it. Well, in the meantime, we, you know, make a call for Japanese cinema that's equally fucked up without the supernatural, sure. and here we have it. Instead, you just bend it on revenge. All of the films in this have been bent on revenge. Rocky's all about bringing himself up, and Japan's all about taking revenge. Slicing it back down. Um, <laughs> so Ami isn't actually played by Kiriyama, if I was making that really uh, confusing. It's a different actor. Uh, she's played by Minash Yashiro, who also worked with the same director from this movie, on Robo Geisha, 
Yeah, which I've is seen a, Robo apparently something else in this kind of genre, it's right? It's similar. It's a lot weirder. It's a lot more sci-fi. There's a lot more transformers. More camp, would you say? Yeah. Yeah, this movie it almost looks subtle by comparison yeah, of a lot of the the posters true. and the trailers and stuff I've seen from this uh, these other movies. Well, one of my favorite aspects of subtlety to Machine Girl, mm-hmm. and I I made it a little unfair because I I kind of pointed it out to you, but that's because we have to do a show and you have to catch all the stuff, and it's it's kind so of, hard. By the yeah. way, it's so hard. <laughs> um, but one of my favorite things about Machine Girl is. You've seen the poster, you know she has a fucking Gatling gun for an arm, FF7 right. style. Yeah. And you've seen the first scene of the movie where she's got the fucking gun sure. on her left arm. And you're sitting there when she's back, you know, what is it, three days later, two weeks later, sure, some shit? Sure, sure. And you just sit there going, when, well, when did she lose her arm? Yeah. And they keep toying with it. She gets her arm deep fried in some... Yeah, uh, yeah some uh some family dinner and that's the same family dinner with the uh what are they serving it's uh red blood and white dinner sauce yeah i believe is <laughs> yeah. some kind of it's so pretty before the fake head spoils the dinner yeah and you get the blood soaked camera which is a uh, sure a big uh a kind of visual thing they do with the movie constantly there's so much blood it's just raining down yeah it's not a little bit of this well, kind of cute comes... children of men you right. know or, or other movies where we've seen that it's literally just streams of blood. It almost looks like the cabin fever, you yeah, know, wiped to red. Yeah. And that happens on the scene where she finally loses her arm. Sure. Which I think is, I, I first time I saw this, I lost my shit because the whole time I'm thinking, when did she lose her arm? When yeah. is she going to lose her arm? And it happens by mistake. Yeah. Well, that's, it's, that's the whoops, other thing. Oh, there goes your arm. So I, this is why I brought Takashi Mika up because I want to ask you this. Uh, for the exact reason that people should be rolling their eyes at me right now. Is Machine Girl have a better split in half than uh, no, Ichi the Killer? That's also a good question. I still think <laughs> Kill Bill has the best one. Is <laughs> the unfortunate thing about that. Uh, we have cartoonish violence. And uh, every time we talk Mike, I mention cartoonish violence because that's, that's how I've labeled that in my head and that's how it makes sense and feels safe to me. I wonder if... Uh, the violence here, if I feel like it's cartoonish or absurd, just because Mike is the only Asian cinema I really know. I mean, is that why I draw that comparison? Or do you feel like those two have do, the type of violence you see? Does that share that commonality? Yeah, I think I mean, I think it is. I think it is really absurdist and cartoonish because this isn't I mean, I don't want to give off the impression that this is serious Japanese cinema. I don't sure. want I don't want Podmanity to walk away from this going Japanese movies. What's with all this blood? Right, right. Because that's not. I mean, they Japanese people make art films, they make sure. dramas, they make comedies. It just so happens that Kill Bill's not based on the dramas or the comedies or the art films. Yeah, right. It's um, based on the Grindhouse. Yeah. Well, when you look at uh, Battle Royale too, that was a lot more serious take, but really similar to Machine Girl, that was a movie that came out in Japan and then was brought overseas and it became a cult hit for American audiences. Sure. I think the Machine Girl is probably a lot more of a cult hit in the United States than it is overseas. That's at least the impression I get from it. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, we pick up on that stuff and it becomes the same way when we talked about Ichi the Killer, this sort of, wow, this is weird. Have you seen this uh, kind of piece of cinema? So it could be a single source that has led me to both of these these places. The fact that they come over here and this is what American audience is like from Japan. Sure, um, I will blame our own culture for my ignorance of Asian cinema and for going, isn't it kind of strange that both of these have cartoonish violence? But you can't deny that it's there, right? I mean, oh, yeah. it, it can be and it is often humorous. Yeah. You know, you're talking now about this arm joke. I mean, that's not just the violence is so ridiculous we think it's humorous. That she accidentally loses her arm and they set the joke up for several different, you know, different scenes. And then she's wrestling the fucking one arm girl is arm wrestling. Yeah. It's a joke. Yeah. It's all, it's just a bunch of jokes and there's tit drills. I mean, these are, they're they're dicking around. It's jokes in camp. And the Super Mourner Gang. Yeah, and, the Super uh, Mourner Gang. What's the other gang. one? Junior High something? Uh, junior High Shuriken Gang. Oh my god, I Neither love it. Neither of which is related to the Crazy 88, though it is arguable that they may have some underground connections. What I really love about the Machine Girl is something you pointed out a little bit. The violence, while it's absurdly over the top and, and way, way cartoonish, 
it's done uh, really in a way in which it's reserved for these short bursts. The movie's fairly tame, and then when the violence comes, that's when there's really no rules. It's just completely unhinged. It's outlandish. Uh, really, anything can happen, and, and often does happen, with yeah. this violence, uh, even in terms of how they're accomplishing it, you know, where it's uh, a little bit practical and then mostly let's just throw some stupid computer program at it. (laughs) It doesn't matter what it looks like. And so you have this, I mean, it sounds ridiculous me even pointing that out. It's a movie about a girl with a machine gun for an arm. But the machine gun is a good example. While this machine gun looks really cheap, it feels great. Yeah. And I think uh, that's kind of how I feel about the whole movie. It's just the the gun's fun to use. And you want her to to have it on her arm. <laughs> you know, it's sad when she's she's getting her arm filleted. Not as much because you feel the character's pain, but because you're thinking, well, goddammit, when does she get the machine right. gun? Every time something happens, you're excited to see her lose her fucking arm, which is <laughs> terrible. But you want her to put a gun on it sure. and, and shoot at people. And when she's shooting, it's great. You know, they have that camera kind of mounted on there. It's the closest thing you really get to a, a first person shooter film and then the chainsaw and then we yeah. do the same fucking thing the chainsaw is great and we're having a blast with the goddamn chainsaw really the whole way through i feel like i have a a fairly good handle on it until there's the you know the drill bra strobe light urine party but even through that i mean I've, i feel like i still uh i still get it well and that's a kind of weird thing that became a big i mean you mentioned robo geisha mm-hmm. and machine girl and then i mean you realize now that a big part of this japanese extreme stuff is weird bodily mutilation sure it's true arms are weapons i mean i i don't want to i i feel like we shouldn't spoil the movie that we're gonna do for the final chapter oh, you want to keep it a secret um I feel like yeah, we we'll, should. We'll uh, keep it a secret for a little but while. That's fine. I, I can say that when we get there, you are not going to believe <laughs> the kind of bizarre stuff they use to create weapons. Because sure. it's all about this spontaneous weapon generation. Sure, yeah. It's about being able to create violence without having to facilitate violence. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah. It was on that Battle Royale episode that we had... Um, Tim Kaiser, who, uh, yeah, who crazy listened Japanese. to the show, he was sending in stuff at the time or whatever. He would Every week, I think, that guy sent us something. It was awesome. And he said, crazy Japanese. And that was his, his sort of tagline that yeah. stuck with him. But that's what it is. It's very crazy cinema. There's this sort of uh, shock value to it. Sure. And, you know, I like to think in my head that all the crazy bodily fluids and the peeing that always seems to happen <laughs> and the mutilation and all of that is uh, Japan's government repressing their sexuality in that film is, and pornography. There is always that. This is what you get, Japan. This is what you get. Well, and another thing is that when we go back to uh, Shogun Assassin and Sex and Fury and another film that we didn't talk about, but Master of the Flying Guillotine. Oh, sure. You get yeah. weird weapons. That's mm. kind of what it was all about. And I mean, you know, that's still a natural thing. It's like, well, we have that over weapons. here. That's yeah. James Bond for us, right? Yeah, exactly. People like to see gadgets and weird stuff. But Japan is bored with strange weapons. Like, th- the weapons have to be real fucking weird or attached to your body. Sure. Or you have to just, I mean. They're 20 years past us. The yeah, strange it's weaponry. absolutely. And if, if sci fi is the basis for invention, I, I am absolutely terrified. When Robo Geisha comes to fruition, when Machine Girl, when people are walking around with chainsaws for legs or, or women don't, you know, anti-rape drill bras, you know, right, these, right, these things are the future of Japan's innovation. You're terrified. I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we have a website and, we uh, do, that's, that's doublefeatureshow.com. Our glorious website will actually take you through the backlog of the Rocky history and the Asia experiment. Definitely. definitely. History. There's a, a whole link section. Uh, when you go right on the page, it's on the right hand side, uh, go down a little bit. And I think it's called Rocky plus Asia and you can find all of that stuff on there. Yeah, that sounds easy enough. And if you get confused, you can always email us at doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. As with uh, last time, still want to hear the feedback, still want to know 
especially if you're into the Japanese extreme stuff, now that we're kind of getting a little bit more modern, a lot of people have seen it. I'm really curious if there's anybody who started at point A and finally got here and didn't hate it. Yeah, right. Um, and if they plan to continue on. If you made it this far, you have to. Yeah, I you guess have that's true. to continue on. And then iTunes as well, where you can leave us a review that I seriously have not read in probably a year. They just make me depressed. I don't want to yeah, see people sad. brag on the show. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I assume maybe they're all really great and I just haven't been there in a year. Oh, the It's a tragedy either way, really. Yeah. What are we doing on the show next time? Uh, next time we're going to do Stakeland and Red State. Awesome. That's really difficult to say. Yeah, it's a little bit of a tongue twister. Uh, I think there's a space in steak land, if that helps. That doesn't help. It doesn't make We got through all easy. the Japanese names. We can't say steak land and red state. Ugh. So that's going to be, uh, what, dangerous environments? Is that... Uh, Watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>